here. Find the exact value of secant 5 pi by 4. I like this one because it's got a little bit of everything to it. Um, so what do we start with? These questions, and the, here's the other thing about these questions, all this trig stuff, and then especially when we add unit 2 into the mix, the questions are similar, but the way you attack them or the way you approach them is very different, and if you go, if you get off on the wrong foot, you're going to find it to be really tricky. You're going to get yourself confused. So you have to have a good understanding of what each question is asking, what it's giving you. Are you going this direction or are you going that direction? And this one, it, this one as well, it, it really, because it's a reciprocal, it's not one of the primary trig ratios. It's got almost every little bit in there. So first thing we're going to start with, let's say, what is secant the reciprocal of? Coast, thank you. And probably on a test, because you could punch this into your calculator and some of you it would spit out the correct answer in exact form. So it will say show all steps. And if it is out of three marks, you probably need to show three steps. You have to show the actual flip or thing I just like. Yes. You should show this. We'll be here all day if we're going to ask about every tiny little detail in every one of these questions. Can you do it a different way? I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about what's necessary as we go. Some people do this. Um, equals the secant of 4 over 5 pi. That's a huge error. Because think about it. If I have um, secant, whoops, try that again, secant theta is 1 over cos theta. Secant theta is not cos of 1 over theta. And that's what you're doing if you do that. OK, now what do we need to figure out? Well, we need to do a couple of things. So I think we want to draw a little axes here. Remember drawing these out, these little sketches off the side can be very useful. What do we have to figure out about 5 pi by 4? And how, how, what's, there's sort of two components to it, but what's one of them at least? Yeah, kind, well we're going to find, we're going to, yes. Okay, cast rule is one of them and what else? How we do that, though? Yeah, but we need to know which one to use. We're going to use special triangles. This is good. That's all important, huh? It is, yeah. we got to figure out what quadrant it's in, right? So how are we going to – I know people are just assuming that that's part of it, but right, we got to figure out what quadrant it's in. So I'm going to count by pi by fours. This is one pi by four, two pi by four. 3 pi by 4, 4 pi by 4, and 5 pi by 4. It's in that quadrant. And the cast rule starts here. The cast rule tells me which ratio is positive in each quadrant. The A stands for all. We are in quadrant 3 where tan is positive. That means cosine is negative. And you're right, the related angle is pi by 4. So this equals negative 1 over cos of pi by 4. And for those of you wondering, you can definitely do both those steps together. You don't have to show these steps separately. So you can go straight to that. But that second step is necessary to be shown if it says show all work. If it says final answer only, I don't know why we would do that because you just punch it into your calculator, but then you could go straight to the answer. Now I have to evaluate. And how do I evaluate? Yep, it's with the special triangles. So we need to know which special triangle this is, the one with pi by fours in it. Pi by two is the other one. That's a right angle. And we need to know that this is one and this is one. The angles are the same, so it's isosceles triangle. So they're both 1. And then through Pythagorean theorem, this is root 2. Most people have that memorized. Hopefully, you still have it memorized from way back in September um, and from last year. But uh, you kind of need to know it. Okay, And it's cosine. So if I pick this angle, it's adjacent 
over hypotenuse, and this is negative 1 over 1 over root 2. And so then I would multiply by the reciprocal, and I could do all that fancy work. You, wouldn't, you would never show this step, but this is what's happening. I don't think you would ever show this step. You could if you wanted, I guess. Works out to negative root 2. So if I was being careful and I was being perfect, and especially if this question was out of three marks, it would be one, two, three. If it's out of two marks, you'd show this step and the final step only. Skip that step. Stop me if there's questions, otherwise we're going to move on. So this is the other kind. That one gave us the angle. You were working out the result of being evaluated. This one's giving you the result of being evaluated, and we have to find the angle. It would be interesting. There's two different types, and I think we'll see the other type coming up. Don't write this down. But what if the question was cotan theta equals 1 over root 5? How is this question different from 1 over root 3? Yeah, root, one, root 3 is in the special triangles, and root 5 isn't. But this would be tricky. I'm not going to put this on the exam, but like this, I think, would fool some people that they'd think that's exact value. I mean, that is an exact value, but it's not in the special triangle, so we can't do anything with it. So how would I solve this one? Yeah, find theta related with your calculator. There's two ways we can find theta related. One's with the calculator, the other's with special triangles. So you got to figure out which. There's two small different ways you could solve this question, so we'll do them both. One way is I know uh, tan theta is opposite over adjacent. That means cotan, whoops of theta is the reciprocal, adjacent over opposite. So we need the special triangle with 1 and root 3 in it. Again, you, gotta, you, you have to recognize that. And here's a common mistake. Here's my right angle. 6 is a bigger number, so people put pi by 6 there. When 6 is in the denominator, it's making the whole thing smaller. So pi by 6 is the, whoops, undo, undo. This should be pi by 3. This should be pi by 6. Pi by 6 is 30 degrees. Pi by 3 is 60 degrees. That's also something we really want to know. And this triangle came from the equilateral. And so this is 1. And this is twice that because the three sides are equal, so that's 2. And by Pythagorean theorem, this becomes root 3. It's helpful to me. That's how I kind of recall it when I do it. Like I just, I sort of remember how that has come from the equilateral triangle. I find that useful to memorize. But if you just have, the shit, have it memorized and you can draw it properly every time and label it properly. But this is one that some people do put part, some of them in the wrong way. Or they go 1, 2, put the root 3 over there. Again, that'd be wrong. Now, to find our related angle, we're looking for what would be adjacent over opposite. What would give me 1 over root 3? So adjacent um, over opposite, it would be pi by 3 because adjacent is 1 and root 3 is opposite. So that means theta related is pi by 3. What do we do next? So cast rule again. And it's cotangent, which is like tangent. Positive. What do we mean by positive? Like the answer is positive that we're given. It's positive 1 over root 3. We could have been given negative 1 over root 3. So it is quadrants 1 and 3. And this is where we use those little formulas. And we don't usually show the work and have to show the work. But in this case, it's just equal to theta related. But you have to 
you ha this has to be called theta related, and you have to show that step as well, 100%. So this is equal to pi over 3. And then what is the little formula in the third quadrant? Adam? That would be fourth quadrant. Yeah. And that works out to, uh, so theta related is pi by 3, so 4 pi by 3. 3 pi by 3 plus 1 pi by 3 is 4 pi by 3. What's the other way that you could do it? I could use tan, and it would be tan theta equals root 3 over 1. But it would still be the same angle. You get the same answer, obviously, hopefully no matter how you do it. But in this case, it's opposite over adjacent, so it's root 3 over 1, so it's still pi by 3, and then the rest would be the same. So that part's sort of by your personal preference, how would you want to do it? All right, next question. Got a graph here, and we got to find its equation. Good question. So I was gonna I was gonna mention that. I think yes, you show some work for a question like this. There's a few reasons why. If you show some work, it's easier to check over later. If you made a mistake or you wrote something, you go, why did I write that? You might be able to figure it out if you showed a little bit of steps. If you ever get it wrong and you showed some work, you're more likely to get part marks. It's kind of up to you. If it says show work in the instructions, then you have to. If it doesn't, then it's kind of up to you. But you know, just I would I would say be careful. Does that make sense? So in this case, I, I would show some work. I would recommend that. Um, and ultimately, to write the equation, what do I have to do? So Lucas mentioned it, like we got like amplitude and everything. We got to find the properties. Periodic functions have special properties. And a lot of what the work we do with them with their graphs is thinking about those properties, like amplitude and period. So I do have to find the amplitude, but like that's part of the process. Ultimately, what do I need to get? I'm going to do that, and that's going to get me to a place where I have... Very good. We need the A value, the K value, the C value, the D value. we got to find those. So this is obviously sine. Just a heads up, I believe there's one of these on the, on the exam. And it's a full curve. It's not just a partial curve, which makes it a bit trickier because you have to decide where it starts. If it's sine or cosine, you'll be told. But you have to figure out where the starting position is, where the zero line is. Some people find it significantly harder, especially if, for whatever reason, you're not super visual, um, when you're not just given one cycle. That's what I would do, I think. Yep. What if we can remember that there's supposed to be stuff there, but we don't remember what the variables, it doesn't matter what the variables are called? Like if you're E sine yeah, just random stuff. V, it would be really weird, but it, you could, just, uh, you, I, you wouldn't lose marks for that, I, I don't think, as long as you were consistent in the rest of your writing. I've never known that to be a problem because we do it so much, but. The thing that's hard is in other courses, they change them. They use P and Q instead of C and D, or H and K instead of C and D. That part's a little bit tricky. Anyway, let's get to this. So, and we are thinking about the five key questions. Five key questions we use for graphing, but we're kind of doing it in reverse order here, definitely. So I start, how do I find the amplitude? There's two different ways. Not quite. Very good. Max minus the min divided by two. Um, that will give me the middle of the, of the, sorry, that will give me half the distance between them, which is what I want. Or if I identify the five key values, which is maybe what you want to do, especially if you have a full, you have a full function, I find my zero line and it's the distance from my zero line up or in zero line down, or I could count from the minimum one, two, three, four, five, six up to the max. And looking at the scale, they each count as 1. 6 divided by 2 is 3. 1, 2, 3 up. 1, 2, 3 down. So the amplitude is 3. Amplitude is always positive. Uh, 
And that gives me my A value of 3. Let's do the 0 line next. So, because I've kind of already done it, it's, it's where those points line up. So y equals 1, which gives us a D value of 1. Even just little things like if you, if you calculate it, sometimes you calculate it, and then when you go to write it down, you're thinking about something else, so you just write the wrong number. So if you calculate it and write it down here, I think you're less likely to make a mistake. Like, again, showing work helps, but I don't know. Maybe not. Okay, to find our C value or where it starts, i got to figure out the scale. So if, this is, if 2 squares is pi by 2, half of that is pi by 4. So this is 1 pi by 4, 2 pi by 4, 3 pi by 4 to get me to the start. And the C value is equal to the start. And then the last one uh, takes a little bit more work. I'm going to find the where it ends as well, or where it stops, in order to find the period. So 2 pi is 8 pi by 4, 9 pi by 4, 10 pi by 4, 11 pi by 4. And the period is 11 pi by 4 minus 3 pi by 4 which is 8 pi by 4, which is 2 pi. Or you could count on the scale. I know, I know every square is pi by 4. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 pi by 4s, which is 2 pi. You don't have to show this work, that's for sure. Well, again, I like if we were being really picky, that would get marked wrong. Cause C because it's because it's minus C. That's where the flip comes in. Right? That equation is x minus C. So C really should be the same as the positive version. Um, for finding out the period, can you or can you back if you just like write the period? We only found the period, we haven't found K yet. Do you remember how to find K? Yeah. Yeah, because it's always 2 pi divided by the period, which is 2 pi divided by 2 pi, which is 1 in this case. No. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's what I just said. Do you have to do the subtracting here? You can just count squares and write it down. That's fine. OK. And so we have y equals a sine kx minus c plus d. So again, double. always go back and double check. There's no reflection. So a is positive. k is 1 x minus 3 pi by 4 plus d, which is 1. Feel OK about that? Now we get one to graph. I'm going to give you a few minutes to get a head start on this one before I catch up.
So this is where we use the five P questions to take the A, K, C, D values, turn them into the properties that we need to know in order to graph. If I know the zero line and the amplitude, I can find the max and the min. And two of the critical points occur there for sine. If I know the zero line and where it starts and where it ends, I can find the other ones. And then we find the x scale as well, right? So I'm going to start with the zero line. y is 1. doesn't matter that you number them either. The numbering system doesn't really make it. Amplitude is 3. It's always positive. And from those two, I get the max and the min, which is the zero line plus the amplitude and the zero line minus the amplitude. Then we look at the start, which comes from the C value, and it's got the opposite sign, so it's negative pi by 6. Then we find the period, which is the little formula of 2 pi divided by a half, same as multiplying by 2, so 4 pi. We don't really need it to graph, but it's a really nice check. Find where it ends by doing the start plus the period. So 4 pi is the same as 24 pi by 6, because 24 divided by 6 is 4. So it should end at 23 pi by 6. Now comes the tricky part. And this is a really good question because it's not super straightforward. We really actually have to kind of think about it to get the right x scale. So to, before the first part of getting our x scale, I should say, is finding the distance between critical points. And there's a small mistake people make here is they take the end value and divide, but we want the period. So you take the period and divide by 4. Why do you divide by 4? Because the 5 critical points, there's the first one, and then the next four break the graph up into four parts. Right? There are four lengths that make up the graph, which are the four points after the first point. So we divide by four to figure out their length. So their length is pi. And then here's the other thing we need to know. So now we're going to find the x scale. And there's two ways you can look at it, but ultimately the x scale has to match for the critical points and has to match the phase shift. And it's a little bit of a guess and check in a way. There's two ways you can think about it. I can find a common denominator between this number and this number. Common denominator. Or I can just start picking values till I find one that works. And so I'm going to take this number, and I'm going to start dividing by things. So for example, I'm going to divide by 3. And this is useful anyway, because when I take that number and divide by 3, that's the number of squares between points. So that's really useful for when you go to graph, thinking about it like that. But that doesn't work. What is pi by 3 again in, in degrees? 60. Pi by 6 is 30. So if I my x scale is counting by 60s, 30 isn't on there. So that's not going to work. So we might try whoop, dividing by 4. 
that's 45. Counting by 45 also doesn't have 30 on it, so that's not going to work. Uh, pi by 5 would be somewhat unconventional, you might say. I'm not sure why you, would, you, you wouldn't normally do that, but you could if you wanted, if it worked. Pi by 6 works, because it is the phase shift, so of course it's going to work. You don't have to show all those. You just have to make sure you can get the right scale. Now we can start labeling and start plotting points. We good? So pi by 6 means 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 takes me to pi. And that means 1, 2, 3 takes me to pi by 2. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to label it like that every 3. So 4 pi by 2 is 2 pi. You are supposed to kind of label it appropriately. And 4 pi is far enough that it takes me past my last point, so I can stop there. And I think I'm going to count every 2 But if you did every one, that would be fine as well. So like that. All right. Double check before you start graphing. You always want to go back and make sure, first of all, you're graphing the right function. Is it sine or cosine? And if there's a reflection, sometimes we write that down, make a note to ourselves, but I always just go and double check. In this case, there is a reflection. It's sine. Sine always starts on the zero line. My zero line is 1, and I'm starting at negative pi by 6, so I go back 1, and I go up to positive 1. And we chose... 6 squared, yep, yeah, but it's sine, so it still starts on the zero line, right? But where does sine go from the first value with reflection? To the minimum, so we're going to go to the minimum. So from here we count 6 squares and go to our minimum value, which is negative 2. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, down to negative 2. And then back to the zero line, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. To the max, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. To the zero line, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And our double check, 4 pi is 24 pi by 6. I go back 1 to 23 pi by 6 which was our end. So it looks like our scale worked out. And we looks good to me. Questions about that? The grid will be good for getting all five points on there for sure. Yep. So here it is. Here's that other type. What is? How is this one different? It's a little bit different from the other one that we did. Adam. Yeah. Inver well, yeah. Yeah. It is inverse. So you do the inverse sign which looks like sine negative 1, which looks like reciprocal, but it's just bad notation. So we get theta equals. I'm only writing this down to remind you that when you put a value like this into your calculator, you do not include the negative. You wouldn't no normally write that down. And it's theta related. That has to be there. So I do this on my calculator. 
and I get 0 0.6. Make sure it's in radians. We talked about this before, but I want to talk about it again, especially those of you who have physics. And I teach another course that does trigonometry in degrees, so I get caught with that too. You got to make sure that you put your calculator in radians. You, you won't have to change it throughout the exam. You shouldn't. Um, but if you had physics the day before or earlier or after, you'll have to change before you go and do the other one, right? So be careful of that. I will try very hard to remind everybody to put their calculator in radians when we start. If I forget, you can remind me to remind everyone. So at least one person in here will remember, and then hopefully we'll all benefit from that. This would usually say round to four decimal places. It doesn't in this case, but um, that's what we want to do. What do we want to do next? Very good. So sine is negative in the bottom two quadrants, not in the top two. So we're going to uh, quadrant three and quadrant four. And quadrant three, we've already done is pi plus theta related. So a couple ways you can do this to get your make sure you get the exact value. I can do pi. Oh, I'm going to do shift sign of the number 0.6259 and keep that number on my calculator, right? And then I just go plus pi, pi plus theta related and theta related plus pi, same thing. Write that down, four decimal places, and then subtract pi to get that number back. And for the fourth quadrant, it's two pi minus, so then I go 2 pi minus my answer, and that is 5.6069. And we checked this morning. If you just use five decimal places up here, you still get the same answer, and that's pretty safe. If you use six, they'd be even safer, but five should be good. If you don't like using the memory function on your calculator, you could store that value in memory, or you could do that little trick that I did. You just got to make sure whatever it is that you get the right four decimal places. Questions. All right, let's keep going. Unit two. That was the entirety of unit one in about 30 minutes. Yikes. Could be, yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Like f determining if a function is even or odd? Is that what you mean? All right. We've got two questions here. One of them's a pi by 12, one of them's a pi by 8. In some ways, they're similar questions, but they're, they're different. They use different formulas. How do I do a pi by 12? So that, good. So that's using the compound angle formulas. What is the compound angle formula for sine of A plus B? This is where people start to get the like, uh, yeah, I had those memorized. Is it like sine A plus B plus sine A sine A? I don't know, is it? Should we take, should we, should we take, should we take a vote here? <laughs> sine A cos B plus cos A sine B. I agree as well, so we have some consensus here, so let's let's go for it. If we're wrong, we'll be wrong together. <laughs> nope. <laughs> so now I have to break up 17 pi by 12 into two. Uh, angles that are multiples of the three angles in the special triangles that add up to 17 pi by 12. So 
the ones that you can use, you cannot use pi by 2 and you cannot use pi. You can use pi by 6, pi by 4, pi by 3, and any multiple of them. That's not like, like you can't use 3 pi by 3. That You can try. Trust me, it won't work. It won't help. Um, so, does anybody know what they are? And you can subtract 2. I could do 20 minus 3, but we're going we're gonna to add. I like it. 8 pi, that's what I was thinking too. So this is sine of 8 pi by 12 plus 9 pi by 12. So 8 pi by 12 is 2 pi by 3 when they reduce to 6, 4, or 3. And 9 pi by 12 is 3 pi by 4. And that's why I can find those. I can use those. So sine A cos B plus cos A sine B. And in this case, you don't have to show all the work. You can and probably want to just go straight to the answer. You may still need to write to draw the triangles. This is pi by 3. This is pi by 6. 1, 2, root 3. Pi by 4, 1, and root 2. So sine of 2 pi by 3, that's in quadrant 2. So it's going to be positive. Sine is positive there. And the related angle is obviously pi by 3. So sine is opposite over hypotenuse. So it's root 3 over 2. Cos 3 pi by 4, 3 pi by 4 is also in quadrant 2. They're not always in the same quadrant. They just happen to be in this case. Also in quadrant 2. And, but cosine's negative there. And the pi by 4s are always 1 over root 2. So again, 2 pi by 3 is still in quadrant 2. Cosine's negative there. But adjacent over hypotenuse is 1 over 2 this time. And then sine of 3 pi by 4 is 1 over root 2. Positive. Sine is positive. And then you have to do the final step, which in this case ends up as negative root 3 minus 1 over 2 root 2. And um, if you had done it slightly different, you might have got negative 1 minus root 3 over 2 root 2 or like, you know, like little differences, but ultimately it's got to equal the same thing. And you can punch this into your calculator and you can punch that into your calculator and you can do a check that they are exactly the same. So if you don't run out of time, if you have time or if you go back and check, this is a good one to check and make sure it's correct. You haven't dropped a negative somewhere or missed a negative in terms of a quadrant or something like that or drew the special triangles wrong. This will check all those things for you. So now... Pi by 8s. How in the world do we do that? With a double angle formula. Thank you. So the pi by 12s are compound. Pi by 8s are double. I want to show you something. So we're going to go back in time here. The questions that 
We're only like two days into unit two here. This is as far as we got. We've got a lot of units to cover still. Um, we got we accomplished a lot this semester, didn't we? Uh, this example from our note from way back when in September was a sine of pi by eight. And for sine of pi by eight, you might think you use the double angle sine formula, but you don't because it won't work. You always use the cosine. So take a look. This is the one that we would use. And this is the formula for sine, 1 minus 2 sine squared theta. OK? So um, for the cos, what is the formula for the double angle of cos? Good. And then the other thing we need to do is this. We make theta the pi by 8. This is key to working all of this out. Starting with the right formula, obviously, and then this step right here. So the theta is our pi by 8, which is 5 pi by 8 in this case, which means 2 theta is 2 times theta, which is 5 pi by 8. And these cancel, which is 5 pi by 4, which is something we can calculate. That's what makes this all work. This equals shouldn't be beside that. It should be beside this. Write out the formula. Sub them both in. Then what do we do? We take all the junk, move it all over to isolate cos of 5 pi by 8. We end up with cos 5 pi by 8 equals, and then we've got it. I'm going to evaluate cos of 5 pi by 4 first. Which quadrant is 5 pi by 4 in? third quadrant. Okay, so cosine is negative there. And 5 pi by 4 is 1 over root 2. So this is negative 1 over root 2 equals 2 cos squared Okay? Then I'm going to bring I'm going to bring the 1 and the 2 over. When I bring the 1 over it, it's positive. So I'm going to write it like this just because it looks a little nicer. Now I'm going to do two things here. I'm going to get a common denominator on top, and I'm going to take the square root of both sides. When you take the square root of both sides, what do you have to do? Plus minus. And the common denominator on top will be root 2. So this is root 2 over root 2 minus 1 over root 2 all over 2 plus minus. So now we've got what we want on the right side. Cos 5 pi by 8, that's what we're evaluating, equals. But I need to write plus or minus, but we can actually figure out which one it is. Because cos of 5 pi by 8 is in a particular quadrant. What quadrant is it in? Very good. It's in quadrant 2. How do I know that? Because 4 pi by 8 is like pi by 2, and it's just a little bit past that. 
So it's in quadrant two where cosine is negative. So then to show that you, because in this case, it worked out to negative. If you didn't do this, you'd get the answer wrong because you'd just leave it positive. You'd just forget and leave it positive. But if it worked out to being positive, I wouldn't know if you just got lucky or you thought about it. So you should write them both down and then circle and cross out the one that it's not. No. Oh, like it, it admissible or something? No. Um, and then I'm going to just do one more step where I'm going to simplify inside the radical. So it ends up being root 2 minus 1 over 2 root 2. And that is the fully simplified final version of cos of 5 pi by 8. And you can check that on your calculator as long as you know how to write that in. You can check that. Any questions? Okay, we have 10 minutes, but, I, but I, what I'm going to do instead of trying to move on is we're going to start with the identity tomorrow. But you can take these 10 minutes and work away at it yourself. Give it a... Give it a try yourself and see if you can get it. That might be a good thing to do, and then we'll take it up tomorrow and continue with the rest of Unit 2 and probably move on to 3 and maybe even 4. Picking up where we left off two days ago. On Unit 2, I think we should be able to get through Unit 2 and Unit 3 today. If we're getting this started, we say left side equals... If you remember back when we did these, starting it out was a lot about observances that you would make comparing the left side and the right side. So what do you notice? It's not always a good Yeah, compound angle. So we've got two compound angles on the left side, but we obviously don't on the right side, which is typical. And it's possible to come up with an equation with a, an identity where you wouldn't do this, what we're going to do, but it would be unlikely to do that because that's kind of the point of this being a grade 12 identity. So what do you think is pretty much certainly going to be our first step? using the compound angle formulas that we learned in this course. So go ahead and try that. Now we already used the sine one the other day and we were reminded of what it is. So you also need to know what the cosine one is. Remind yourself of that. We already talked about this. You got to memorize those. There's six of those. It's five double angles. Got to know all of them. Oh, no, that's right. And it's all of that times cos y. And like I said, the sine one we've seen And if we're comparing these, 
So the sign one we saw before, it has the same sign. This is x plus y, and this one is adding as well. But the sign in the cos chain, so it's sine x cos y, and then cos x sine y. And this one, it's cos is together and sine together, but the sign changes. So this was plus, and now it's minus. Otherwise, they're very similar, and all of them are very Well, all the cosine and sine ones are similar. What do you think we do now? So multiply the cos y into this bracket and multiply the sine y into this bracket. Cos x times cos y times cos y is cos x cos squared y. And same thing over here. So sine x. So again, this is cos x times sine squared y. Always keeping an eye on the right side, but it's not all that helpful, at least not yet, because all it is is cos x. And I mean, I think this is obvious, but we're not going to do anything in this question with the right side. Sometimes we do a bit of work on one side, a bit of work on the other side. But in this case, uh -uh, you would have no idea what to turn cos x into. So there's no point. You're going to go down a rabbit hole if you try to do anything on the right side. So in this case, we're sticking with the left. What do I want to do now? Yeah, notice that the middle two terms are the same, except they have opposite signs. Not too hard, except that it's uh, they are in a different order. So just reminding ourselves that that's fine. That doesn't matter. Sine x, sine y, sine x, sine y, cos y. Order of multiplication doesn't matter, so those are the same. So that one's gone and that one's gone. And now what? See that? Yeah, and if, usually you're going to do this anyway. Sometimes we factor, sometimes we don't. That's true. Um, often, if there's a common factor, it's going to work out that it's useful. But in this case, I pretty much know that I'm going to common factor it. Why? Because the right side is cos x. So it's really useful to get the cos x out like that. And now I, a couple of things have happened. I've got the result I'm looking for all by itself on the left side. That leads me to believe I'm on the right track. And what's the last little step that we have to notice? Yeah, that's the Pythagorean identity. So this just works out to cos x. So the other thing that I'll remind you of is that one of the things we look at is the left side starts with two things added together, and the right side only has one thing. And you, that's got to be resolved somehow. I always think about these resolutions, things that are different that need to be made the same. And often when we do that, it's with a fraction, and you collect like, or sorry, you get um, common denominator, and add the two fractions together to take two things and turn them into one thing, and from there it works out. But in this case, it didn't have a fraction, so it's going to be something else that's going to cause that, and you know, it could quite likely be common factoring the way this one worked out that that would happen. The, it's interesting that in grade 11, a lot, of the, a lot of the identities are in some ways more interesting. We did a lot of grade 11 identities for practice in this course as well. The grade 12 ones are not always as interesting because it's obvious. Cos x plus y, you're going to use the formula to turn it into single angles of just cos x and cos y and sine x and sine y, and then work on it from there. Whereas things with, with fractions and with factoring and stuff that happens in grade 11, it's a little bit more interesting to me. But grade 12 course, where you do in grade 12 identities, there are two I'll tell you on the exam. Uh, and there's two kind of new kinds of identities that we will talk more specifically about the exam next week. But there's two specific kinds of identities that we added in grade 12, and it was compound and double. So you, know, you might expect one of each on the exam kind of thing. Did you have a question? I think we probably could have, and then you would have got cos squared y minus cos squared y, which would 
and then that would just equal one anyway. So it's really the same process. Yeah, definitely. Uh, any other questions? We good with this one? But remember all the other little tricks, like I said, with common denominators with fractions. I mean, we still see fractions in grade 12 identities. I'm not saying they wouldn't happen. And factoring when it's appropriate or expanding when it's appropriate and all those other little tricks that uh, can come up in these questions. Moving right along. So this is a, an equation that I'm solving. If you can't quite see it because it's in a mix of the words, here's the equation. And we're solving for theta, where theta is between 0 and 2 pi. Otherwise, they'd be an infinite number of answers. And this is a simple one, I would say, in a lot of ways. There are many other types. So to talk about that a little bit, if I had a co-squared and a sine theta, I'd be doing a swap out with the Pythagorean identity. Remember, I'm going to go quickly through a lot of this. It's, this is not practice time. This is just review time. You may ask questions, absolutely. Um, but otherwise, I'm going through quickly, and I am explaining as we go, but I'm not going to stop and wait for you to do all the thinking because we would never get through all of if we had to stop and wait every every time we're doing a line. So I'm going to kind of whip through this. Stop me if you have questions, but I will also remind you of little details. If the detail doesn't make sense to you, make a note of it. Go to the review and practice some of those yourself. That's what would be my recommendation. We're only doing one of these, but there are lots of other types. So there's the types where you have a co-squared theta and a sine theta. You're doing a swap out. There are types where you might common factor to split the terms apart if you have a sine and a coast, but no squared, probably or a tangent or something like that, probably going to be a common factoring kind of question. So there are other kinds of questions. This one's a simple, straightforward one. We're going to start minus 11 cos theta, bringing the two, whoops, bringing the two over. So plus two equals zero. And since there's no swap out or anything, this is in this form, five a squared minus 11a plus 2. And we're just going to factor that. We just notice that that's factorable. It is factorable. Um, for these, it could not be, but I don't think we, I don't think we saw, did we see one like that? You would use the, you would have to use it. Huh? You don't know what this is? What would you do if it wasn't factorable? So there'd be the quadratic formula. I mean, it's certainly possible. Cos theta equals, yeah, we might have seen one or two of these. I think you're right. Um, and then you would do the quadratic formula with those in there. It's doable. Uh, we didn't do a lot of them. So, you know. <laughs> so, uh, so now we're doing... Um, uh, oh, and they're both going to be negative because the middle term's negative, but the last term's positive. So they've got to multiply to a positive, but they're adding to a negative. So get your signs done. You don't have to do it with A's on the side. Some people might like to, but we got to do it with the cos thetas over here. So therefore, 5 cos theta minus 1 is 0 or cos theta minus 2 is 0, which means cos theta is 2. So what do I do with that? Inverse cos, try that on your calculator. How come you're not trying it on your calculator? Cos doesn't go up to 2. So I want to talk about something right here. Um, this exam is fairly tried and tested. It's not identical every year, but it's similar, right? So we are pretty confident that it's a fair exam. Two and a half hours can be done in two and a half hours with preparation. Part of that preparation is knowing some efficiencies. So I will point out efficiencies as we go. You may not need all of them, but all the ones you do have are going to help you. So an efficiency here is knowing very quickly that cosine has a max of 1 and a min of negative 1. And if, if you have, and we often see this in questions like this, where one of them, 5, meh, not possible, done. I don't even need to think about it. Just jumps out at me. 
but you don't need all the efficiencies. If you know quickly to go to your calculator, you punch in your calculator, you're quickly going to get an error. Now, if you stumble and say, oh, I'm doing something wrong, now is where you're losing time. And if you have to stop and think very often about little things that you should just know, that's when you get yourself into trouble. That being said, we don't usually have people running out of a lot of time on this exam. And then on the other side, cos theta is 1 over 5. So what do I do with that? That one I need to use my calculator. And I punch it in. I shift cos of 1 divided by 5. And I get that gets me theta related, which I'm just going to give you. It's 1.3694. And then I get two answers. It's positive. Cosine is positive in quadrants 1 and 4. And I get these two answers. And the second one comes from 2 pi minus theta related. Yep. Probably you're going to factor to solve at some point. But like I said, there could be a step here where you do some kind of swap out or common factor. So if it said, uh, okay, I can't make one up on the spot. That will work. They're harder to make up. But if I, But if it was a question like, 5 sine squared theta plus 3 cos theta minus 2 equals 0. You would do 5 1 minus cos squared theta plus, yeah. And then you'd have to expand that, collect this with the negative 2 over there, and now you've got so, uh, uh, another one that you can actually factor. Yeah. Questions? Other questions? All right. So this one is also sort of an equation, but it's a, it's a, well, simple in one way, but but has an extra step in another way because it's tan two theta. So this is a double angle equation, and it adds an extra step because what do we know about tan two theta? That's a compression, a horizontal compression by a factor of two. 